Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Lord's house tonight, and we're glad you're here. We welcome you to CBS Core and trust that you would feel the warmth and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, as well as some great fellowship together as we share in God's house in worship and praise tonight. You know what? Carol Ann, I think, already has a, some courses already picked out, but I want us to sing one tonight that says, I just feel like something good is about to happen. Do I hear an amen? amen? I just feel like something good is on its way. Well, those of you who were here this morning, uh, we would know that God did something marvelous in our service as a, a soul surrendered her life to Jesus. Bless you, Fiona. And we continue to praise the Lord for your life. And we believe tonight that God would speak to hearts that are here and that you would have that desire within to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior and as your friend. And if the Lord speaks to you, that you wouldn't hold back in any way but surrender to Him. So will you stand and let's believe together corporately in worship that something good is on its way. Amen? Here we go. Let's sing together. I just feel like something good.
sins away. Praise the Lord. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. If that's your testimony, when we get to that part that says Amazing Grace, lay, re raise your hand as a signification that, yes, you know what it is to have your sins washed away. Let's sing it together. He going to do in our midst here tonight for us. We're going to sing a new chorus that the men learned at men's camp back in August. And we've been trying to find a time to put that chorus into our service. And tonight is the night. I serve a Savior. It's what I was made for. His grace and love I don't deserve. I will be faithful, humble and grateful. My life is greater because I serve a savior. Is there an amen to that one? Yes, there is. Amen. I serve a savior. This is what it sounds like. Let's sing it together. We're going to play it in F. It's what we practiced it. I serve a savior.
experience it is to know that he is our Savior. And the truth of this chorus says we don't deserve the love and the grace that he gives us. But yet his love outpours to us so much that he wants us to experience his grace. He wants us to know it. And he has given his life. He's given his all so that we may know what it is to serve him. Let's sing it again a couple more times. You're singing it very, very well. It's a chorus I have a feeling we won't be putting away in the shelf somewhere. Let's sing it again. And then for those of you who are watching online, your bulletin will be posted for you early this week. Please be advised of a dinner and a show that will be taking place on March the 14th. And this will be in support of Newfound Brass. And to get your tickets or for further information, please be sure to see Carol Ann. And the poster is available on each of our bulletin boards. So please take a few moments to go through the announcements that are there. I would like to mention, as the ushers are coming forward for the offering, I would like to mention that next Sunday we will be launching the Partners in Mission campaign. And this week, if during the week you have any water bottles that you're finished with, if you could bring them to the church office or here in the evening, we would greatly appreciate it. And that's for a project that we will be making available to our young people on Sunday. I'll ask the ushers to come for your offering, please. A reminder as well, Men's Fellowship Dinner Meeting will be taking place on Monday, February 17th. Special guest, Ed Noseworthy, and the sign-up sheet is available in the bulletin board for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence, Lord. Say thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your love, your mercy, for your provision, Lord, for each and every day. Heavenly Father, just now, as we give back to you from all that you have blessed us with, is our prayer that you will take our gifts, that you will multiply them, May they be used, Lord, to bring honor and glory and praise to your name. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, giving you great thanks. Amen. Amen.
so much, Dan, for that reminder. Amazing love. And can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? In our song, four, four, five in our psalm book, says, All have need of God's salvation. If with him they'd live forever, but a promise he has given, it is written, whosoever. None excluded, Hallelujah. all included in the plan of God's redemption. And we pray this, this evening, if there are those here who do not have a relationship with him, he died for you as well as he died for me. Can we stand as we sing that together, please? Thank you. salvation all who turn to Christ will be saved and we're going to share together uh, in these moments in a few moments of prayer if the worship team could prepare to help us out I want us to sing together a song that says to the river I am going bringing sins I cannot bear come and cleanse me we can all cry this out to the Lord tonight come and cleanse me come forgive me Lord, I need to meet you there in these waters, healing mercy. I want to tell you tonight that those healing waters still flow. Amen. They're as fresh as ever for those who would reach out and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Not just to be saved, but there could be something else that you're in need of tonight. And I would ask that you would reach out to the Lord. We have a list of names uh, before us tonight that are in desperate need of prayer, and we know physically some of them aren't in a good place, and 
And some aren't, are going through difficult struggles in their lives in many, many different ways. And so we have opportunity tonight to, uh, to mention them. And so I'm going to ask that we sing uh, these verses together in the chorus. And I believe that uh, God will speak to us tonight as we share these words together. To the river I am going. Then we'll bring some names uh, to the throne of grace in prayer. The key of F. We're in the key of F. Let's, uh, let's sing it in the key of F. To the river I am going. To the river. just read those names to you as we just uh, reflect and have some time of prayer together. Paul Anthony's mom, Doris, in need of our prayers. Vanessa Loveless, our secretary, uh, our admin assistant, underwent surgery this past week in need of our prayers, so pray for Vanessa. Kristen Bailey, it's Major Wycliffe and Shirley's daughter, pray for her tonight and the family. Uh, Barry Morgan, let's continue to pray for Barry. We rejoice over what God continues to do in Barry's life, and I'll assure you tonight that he's on the countdown to come home, and he is so excited about that, and so, Barry, I know you're probably watching in these moments. Know that your church family is longing for your arrival home, and for Shirley as well, of course. We continue to pray for you, Jim, who you, as you uh, continue in treatments in these days, and uh, David Oliver, we pray for you, David, tonight. Uh, Judy, Corps Sergeant Major in Moncton, not doing it all well, requesting prayer. And so we, uh, we remember Judy tonight. Tanya Sweetapple in Edmonton Hospital, not doing at all well, in need of our prayers tonight. And Lee and Wilson are in Jamaica on a missions trip. And so we, uh, we solicit your prayers on their behalf as they minister uh, to so many over these next days through a project uh, that they'll be involved in as well. Gord Whedon, we keep you in our prayers, my friend, and we believe that God uh, will continue to work that miracle uh, that's needed in your life tonight and in the days to come. There are so many who are in need of our prayers. Let's go to that final verse. If we could, come and join us in the river. Come find life beyond compare. He is calling. He is waiting. Jesus longs to meet you there. I want to do something tonight before we even sing that verse. Maybe we can go back to the healing waters verse. In these waters, healing mercy flows with freedom from despair. Who in this place tonight has a need that you need uh, us to pray for? Come on, lift your hand. Don't be shy. 
We need to see your hands. And if in these moments you feel the need to come for prayer, I invite you to do that. As we just bring your needs together corporately to the throne of grace in prayer. And we believe that God works miracles. You believe that, right? Lord, think of you tonight. You and your uh, recent diagnosis. We know that the journey ahead may be somewhat challenging for you. Uh, Would you mind coming? Get this church to pray over you tonight. Jim, would you come? Come on, those of you who are here tonight who have those needs, I'm inviting you to just come. Let's be free in this place. The Word of God reminds us to bear one another's burdens, right? To uplift one another. To share in the needs of each other. And I don't believe at all that we need to be shy in these moments, but we need to trust God for His healing touch. That's right, David. Come forward tonight for prayer. That's it. Come on. In these waters, healing mercy. It's all about support, isn't it? Tonight we we remember the, the, this morning's service and our focus, how we were joined together. We're connected. We belong. And oh, how we just need to reach out in these moments and believe for the healing touch of God, the healing waters to just flow over. Those who need it tonight in these waters, healing mercy. That's it, church. Bless the Lord. Ah, let's pray together after we sing these words in these waters, healing mercy. Yes. Oh, in these waters. Thank you, first of all, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, because we know there is power in the name of Jesus. We know, Lord, that there is healing in the name of Jesus. We know there's salvation in the name of Jesus. And there's no one else that we go to tonight, only to you, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By your stripes, Lord, we know tonight that we are healed. And we claim that promise in these moments for your children who have stepped out in faith who believe, Lord, in your healing touch, who have needs that that are longing to be met. And, Lord, we know tonight that they can be met in you, a loving and a compassionate and a caring Savior. So, Lord, those names that were mentioned tonight, I just want to bring to you, Gord, tonight. Lord, you know the, the diagnosis, Lord. You know what he has been faced with in these days and the challenge Lord that he is faced with we just pray almighty God that you will work a miracle that's needed 
Lord, we pray that everything will begin to fall into place that's needed for His healing touch. Whatever that is, Lord, tonight, we know that You can make it happen. The eternal God who put everything in place, we trust You, Lord. For Gord's life tonight, Lord, we thank you for his faith. We thank you, Lord, that he serves you. He knows you as his Lord and Savior. Bless Linda tonight as well. And we pray that the peace of God would cover her, would cover them as a couple, and that they would feel and know and sense the presence of the Almighty in their lives. Lord, I thank you for Jim. Thank you for what you've done in his life in these days, what you continue to do. And Lord, as he continues upon this journey of of chemo treatments, Lord, that you will continue to work the miracle that's needed in his life. Lord, thank you for, for Barry Morgan tonight. Thank you for the healing in his life. And how you continue to work it all out for him. We anticipate, Lord, his homecoming. And we pray that you will work all that out in these days as he prepares him and Shirley for that time. We pray for David Oliver tonight, Lord. We know battling cancer as well, in need of that healing touch. Lord, we pray that you, the Almighty, would touch him with your healing hand tonight. Lord, we pray for Judy, Corps Sergeant Major, Moncton, New Brunswick. You know all about her, Lord, and what her needs are tonight. We ask a miracle for her. Lord, we pray for Kristen Bailey. You know the situation, Lord, in her life. And we pray, Lord, for Major Wycliffe and Shirley and the family and all that they're going through right now. Lord, we pray again that the peace of God that transcends all understanding would guard their hearts and would walk and journey with them in these moments of uncertainty and unrest. Paul Anthony's mom, Doris, we pray for her tonight. We thank you for Vanessa as well for bringing her through surgery. Lord, there are so many. Tanya, sweet apple, Lord. Just a young woman who who struggles, Lord, on life support. You know all about her, Lord. We pray that you would work a miracle, that you would heal her, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, it's all about you. And we trust you, Lord. We have confidence in what you are able to do. Lord, I thank you for this church family. Thank you, Lord, that... That you continue, Lord, to move by your Holy Spirit in this place. And we know that there are people tonight who are searching. There are people, Lord, who are here who have not yet surrendered their life to you. Lord, may they realize that their hope is in Jesus. May they realize that salvation is in you. And they can claim that tonight just by exercising their faith and stepping out and saying yes to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're all in one accord here tonight. And we know as the disciples met in one accord what happened. Lord, a mighty rushing wind of the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Lord, we ask for that tonight in this place. That Holy Spirit, you would fall afresh upon each and every one of us in these moments. We claim all of these people for you. We corporately lay them at the feet of Jesus. And we ask, Lord, for your will to be done. Heal, Lord. Save, Lord. Bring what's needed to our people tonight, and we trust you. We claim all this, and we pray it in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend, and our coming King. Amen and amen. Come, Holy Spirit, I
name it. We seal this moment with an amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. I'm going to give it over to the worship team in just a second here. I want to welcome someone pretty special to this congregation tonight. Major Barb, welcome back. Welcome back. She is pretty special. What did, what did you say? I'm home. I understand. Yes, indeed. You are home. So it's been about six and a half or so months now that we've been here. Close on seven months, maybe. So Major Lauren is not allowed back until we're here about 12 months or so. Uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. Lauren, if you're watching. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. What a good sense of the spirit we have in this place tonight. And so worship team, lead us in more worship. Well, we're going to sing a, a lovely chorus. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your hands to God. Pray in the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. That's four flats for us. And uh, we're going to sing that song and enjoy the presence of the Lord and the presence of each other as we sing it together. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit. strength. Let's sing it together. This is a little more, it's, I can't call it new because it's probably like 1986 or something, but it's newer to this congregation. We're going to sing it tonight and we're going to praise him because this is a wonderful course of testimony. Let's sing it. Thank you. My life is in you.
I just sung that song, my hope is in you. We sing, all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday is gone. All my sins are forgiven. And I've been washed by the blood. Let's sing it.
my chains are gone. Are yours? It's a question for all of us this evening. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. I actually have three scripture readings for tonight, and all of them are 20 or 30 verses each, but we're only going to read this one. We're only going to read this one, Exodus chapter 20, beginning to read at verse 1. Will you stand for the reading of God's word this evening? And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Mm -hmm. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Father, we thank you for your word this evening, and we pray your blessing upon it. And we pray that just now, as we sit and we listen to your word, as we listen to your spirit speak, as only you can to each of us individually, that you will help to close out the noise that surrounds us. Not the noise that's in this sanctuary, but the noise of life, the, the noise of the outside. And we just pray that you would speak to us in our spirits, that you would open our minds and our hearts and our ears, that we may hear you, the voice of the living God. Be with us and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Can I see your hands this evening? Oh, come on. There we go. What do you have on your hands? Besides fellowship, <laughs> we might have different number of digits depending on what kind of life you have led, but we have fingers, do we not? And what else do we have on our fingers? Besides our nails, we have our fingerprints. We know what fingerprints are, don't we? We know that every single individual has a unique set of fingerprints. No two people's fingerprints are identical. Even if you are identical twins, your fingerprints are different. It's amazing to think about, isn't it? Of all the people who ever lived, of all the people who will ever live beyond you, no two people will ever have the same fingerprint. It can blow your mind if you stop to think about that. In about 2000 BC, the Babylonians would put fingerprints in soft clay, and, and we know that from, from scripture, don't we, to protect against forgery and, and to um, protect important documents. And in ancient China, impressions of fingerprints were used as signatures for those who couldn't write their name. 
Fingerprints first appear on an unborn child about four months into a pregnancy. Imagine. Fingerprints first accepted as valid police procedure in 1901 back in Scotland Yard. Fingerprints reveal who you really are. In Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6, we're told that God's glory is revealed throughout his creation. His fingerprints are everywhere we look. And I like the way that the New Living Translation has worded Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4. And in it it says, The heavens tell of the glory of God. The skies display his marvelous craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak, and night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is silent in the skies, and yet their message has gone out to all of the earth, to, and their words to all the earth. The sun lives in the heavens where God placed it. An author by the name of Brent D. Earls once wrote, The stars are God's fingerprints. The sun is a mere smidgen of his radiance. The moon is to remind us that he doesn't sleep at night. The vastness of space proclaims the infinity of his wisdom, while the sand pebble indicates his thoroughness with the puniest details. The lion hints at his fearlessness. The bear hints at God's power. The hawk at his keen insight. And yet, those possess only a tidbit of God's omnipotence and omnipresence. Every tree points towards heaven, he says. Every bird has a song to sing. Even every moment of wind goes in some direction. There is nothing chaotic about our beautifully designed world. All of creation has a message to tell, he says. He says, listen, there is a God. There is a God. And if we look closely enough, then we will see God's fingerprints are everywhere in our world. Now, some would ask, now, Major, do you really think that God has fingerprints? Well, Revelation 6 and verse 16 tells us he has a face. John 10 and 29 tells us that God has a hand. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says that God has arms. And yes, I believe God has fingers. Because Exodus 8, 19 tells me that. Luke 11 and 20 tells me that. And in Exodus 31, 18, I'm told that the Ten Commandments were inscribed on two tablets by, of stone by the finger of God. Do I believe God has fingers and fingerprints? Indeed I do. Scripture told me he did. And so that's where I want to go this evening. In fact, there were three different times in the course of history that God took the time to write out his thoughts by hand. And what he had to say was so important that he gave handwritten notes so that we wouldn't be able to miss the purpose, so that we wouldn't be able to miss the significance of his message. And I want to look at these three places in time tonight, and then I want us to decide what we are going to do with these handwritten notes that God has given us. The first time God wrote, we read from Exodus chapter 20, he wrote the law. When Adam and Eve lived in, innoc in innocence in the Garden of Eden, there was no knowledge of good or evil because evil didn't exist in their hearts or their minds. But then when Satan deceived them and they fell and they ate from the tree of, of knowledge and good and evil, then sin entered their world and they were suddenly confronted with choices that they never really needed to know. Their innocence was lost. And at this point in time in Exodus, God wanted to make the boundaries of sin very clear to his chosen people. He knew that by simply removing them from the bondage of Egypt, that they would never be truly free because they would only end up trading one type of bondage for another. And so he sent Moses up to Mount Sinai, communing with him for 40 days and 40 nights. And while Moses was there, God etched in stone with his own finger the Ten Commandments. Exodus 31, 18, when the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. And, and you say, well, how is law freedom? Freedom means being free. Freedom means not having any rules. Okay. Imagine with me for a moment that you are going to a hockey game. Imagine it was the one last night. <laughs> it can be any sport, but I choose hockey because unfortunately it's the main sport in our house. And so you get to the stadium and you find that there are no lines on the ice. There are no center lines. There are no blue lines. There are no goalie creases. Some players are wearing helmets and they use sticks while others don't. There are no referees because there are no rules. The puck is dropped by a player and it's every man for himself. Can you imagine the chaos? Yeah. 
Games without rules are unthinkable, right? Even worse is a society without laws. Try driving anywhere if there are no traffic guidelines. And in some places of our world where we have been, there have seemed like there have been no traffic guidelines. But go under surgery at the hands of a physician who has never, ever earned a, a degree. Think about that. There are some don'ts that actually set us free. Agree? Our children... Our children's lives, they are filled with no's and don'ts and negatives because we love them, right? The no's and don'ts that, that teach them not to touch the red, pretty red circle on the stove or poke their fingers into an electrical outlet or to not go running in an icy parking lot or to not chase a ball if it runs out into the street. It's for their own good. These rules are put in place to preserve and to protect their best interests, are they not? The Ten Commandments were created for our good. In Deuteronomy 9.10, again, it tells us that the Lord inscribed them by his finger. He wrote the law. And it was important because it gave us God's clear-cut definition of sin. And you see, what that does is it points out or it brings to light what sin is so that we are able to recognize it. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't make idols. Don't misuse the name of the Lord your God. Don't forget to take a rest. The Sabbath day, keep it holy. Don't dishonor or disrespect your father or your mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. And you know how the law is broken that I'm, I'm sure you've been taught. The first four all had to do with our relationship with God and the last six with our relationship to each other. And when Jesus was asked which one of these were the most important, he said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. Because you see, if you love God with all of your heart, then it's only logical that you will put him first. It's only logical that you're going to put away idols. It's only logical that you're not going to take his name in vain and that you will honor his day. It's only logical that you are going to obey what he tells you to do and that you will want to live how he wants you to live because you love him. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, then it's only logical that you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to kill them. You're not going to lie to them. You're not going to commit adultery with him or her. You're not going to be covetous of them. But you would rather honor them. Doesn't that make sense? Although God's law is extremely important, and we need it to point sin out, the Ten Commandments are not a system of salvation. No one gets saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. How many here have ever broken one of them? If you fail to raise your hand, you have just broken a Ten Commandment. <laughs> God's law requires perfection. Are you perfect? The first time God wrote, he drew a line that we should not cross over. He created clear, he created distinct boundaries, and told us that if we move outside of those boundaries, then we have sinned. And we have fallen short. And so the law created a lot of guilt. Because we all sin. And we continuously fall short of the mark that God has set for us. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Friends, you and I were never expected to live up to God's standards without God's help. The law was created to bring our sin to light and to make us realize that we can never be anything apart from the power of God and that, and that we have to go to him for help. We need his direction. We need his strength. We need his guidance. The second time God wrote, he wrote judgment. And you can read in Daniel 5, verses 1 to 30. It's the account of Belshazzar and the writing on the wall, remember? It's a terrifying thing to fall into judgment at the hands of a living God. King Belshazzar was partying hard until he read the handwriting on the wall, and then the party was suddenly over. Daniel 5 and verse 6 says his face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. And then in verse 9 it tells us that he became terrified and his face grew even more pale. Because, you see, he had mocked God and he had broken one of his laws that says, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. When Belshazzar said, Bring in the gold goblets from the temple of the God 
of Jerusalem and fill them up. He was mocking God. And then as they drunk themselves into a stupor, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron and wood and stone. And in doing that, Belshazzar mocked the one true God and he brought judgment upon himself. You see, you don't want to mess around with the one true God. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 10.31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You can mock gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone because they're dead. They're non-existent anyway. But if you mock the living God, then you bring judgment upon yourself. You know, there are people all around us who mock the one true and living God every single day by the way they live. They take his holy name in vain. They live in immorality. They drink themselves into a drunken stupor every weekend. They watch and promote pornography. They take the things of God lightly as if they aren't true. They make fun of the Bible. They make fun of church. They make fun of Christians. They act like they can do anything they want to do without any consequences, without any judgment. They're arrogant in their sin. You've met them. I've met them. But listen. If you are living in ignorance and rebellion and you had to stand before Almighty God today to give an account for the way that you've been living, your face would turn pale and your knees would begin to knock from fright until your legs collapsed underneath you. Sin is not, never has been, and never will be a joke to God. And if you stand before him and your sin has never been covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, it's going to be a terrifying moment for you. Don't walk in pride and don't walk in arrogance before God as if he can't touch you because one day you are going to stand before him to give an account. You cannot mock God and get away with it. Now there will always be people who will try to sugarcoat or downplay the judgment of God. Belshazzar didn't realize the serious nature of what he asked for or he would never have requested those gold goblets from Jerusalem to be brought to him. Daniel told him, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You honored all these false gods, but you dishonored God. You dishonored the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. And then he went on to tell King Belshazzar what the handwriting on the wall meant. Your days are numbered. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. You've lost your kingdom. And you know, he had to have been shocked when he realized the drastic outcome of his sin. And likewise, if you and I go on willfully sinning and sinning and sinning without any interest in repentance or, or any interest without calling upon the mercy of God, then we are going to be shocked with the drastic outcome of our sin. Romans 6 and 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, eternal death. Hebrews 9 and 27 says it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. When the handwriting of God appeared on the wall, the king was shocked because he didn't believe that, that something like that could happen to him. But as Belshazzar learned, the judgment of God is serious business. We look at God's past judgments and re we remember not to let history repeat itself. Verse 30 says, that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain. You know, to say that God will not judge sin is to deny his word, is to deny his holiness, it's even to deny history, because God has proven that he is a God of justice. He has always judged sin. In this instance, his finger of judgment wrote death and destruction for one man. In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and 19, it wrote destruction for an entire city that was living in sin. In the case of Noah and the ark, remember Genesis 6, it wrote destruction for the entire planet when the world was described as a place where every man's thought was only evil all the time. This is serious business. And we need to take it seriously. Eternity is forever. Not for a thousand years, or ten thousand years, or a hundred thousand years, or a million years. It's forever. God wrote the law. And God wrote judgment. But the third time God wrote, he wrote grace. And we turn to John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. 
The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. You know, no one really knows what it was that Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger that day, but I can tell you what he wrote on the heart of a hurting woman standing naked and ashamed because of her obvious sin. Through his son, Jesus Christ, the very same God who wrote the law defining sin and the very same God that wrote certain judgment for all those who willfully cross that line, now writes grace. And oh, how beautiful is his handwriting. Romans 6 and 23, what did we say it was? For the wages of sin is death, but, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, what does it say? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. She had broken God's law. She had crossed over the line. She missed the mark. She deserved judgment, and the religious leaders were ready and willing to oblige. But Jesus' message to her and to every one of us who would ever follow him was clear. As long as you are living and breathing in this life, my grace extends to you one more chance. I know I'm thankful for the grace of God today. This woman was condemned by the leaders by her own sins. But because of the grace of Jesus, he caused those leaders to drop their stones, and then he looked at her. And he said, neither do I condemn you. And that leads to the wonderful truth of Romans 8 and 1, which says, therefore, there is now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, the finger of God represents power. In the first two instances, it symbolizes God's power to judge us. And that's God's right. He has a right to do that. No one is able to stand up against the finger of God. But by grace, that same finger is powerful towards us. The Bible says in John 1.12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In judgment, the finger of God just lays us bare and exposed. But you see, our exposure, it's also our salvation. Scripture has told us, you see, that when we confess our sins, when we just lay them out there, when we acknowledge our guilt, when we lay it before him, then his grace is extended to us. His spirit comes and seals us for God's own. He marks us as his. Amen? 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20 says, You are not your own. You are bought at a price. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, it's then that we can live in the secure knowledge that no one can take away that seal of ownership. No one can damage that seal. No one can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. No one can get rid of that fingerprint of God that's now on us. Jesus says that to those who follow him, he gives eternal life and they shall never perish. You see, the same finger that finds us out that points at our guilt, it's the very same finger that also takes away the sin of the world. There's a story that one night Martin Luther went to sleep troubled with his sin, and in a dream he saw the angel standing by a blackboard, and at the top of the blackboard was his name. And the angel with chalk in hand was listing all of Luther's sin, and the list filled the blackboard. Luther shuddered in despair, feeling that his sins were so many that he could never be forgiven. But suddenly in his dream, he saw a pierced hand writing above the list these words. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And as Luther gazed in amazement, he said in his dream, the blood flowed from the wounded hand and washed the record clean. And it reminds me of a chorus that I know and we used to sing years ago, but for the blood shed on Calvary's tree. But for the blood, there'd be no hope for you and me. For all my righteousness are filthy rags, and that's all I'd ever be. But for the blood that cleansed and set me free. Friends, the invitation this evening is for you to look at these handwritten notes from God, our Creator, our Heavenly Father, 
and experience his grace. You don't ever have to sit underneath that judgment of God. To know today that whatever wrong you have done, whatever the type of life that you have been living, regardless of its extent or regardless of what people think, it can all be forgiven. It can be forgiven as long as there is breath in your lungs and you cry out to God. It can be forgiven. Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin. And I know that there are those here tonight who have family members and friends that, that perhaps live as Belshazzar lived, without a thought of, or care about God or about eternity or, or about living a life that pleases God. And there are people here tonight who know others like the woman who stood as an outcast already judged by the world. And friends, we need to pray. That's the secret of, of it all, is to pray. We need to pray that they would recognize that the grace and the mercy of God our Father is real and that it's available for them. We need to pray that they need to know that there is forgiveness. We need to pray that they realize that there is healing, that there's restoration, and that there's love. There is love in the family of God. We saw it this morning. We've seen it already this evening. To heal the broken heart he came. To free the captive from his chain. The blood he spilt when he was slain brings guilty sinners home to God. Amen? Amen. To thy cross I come, Lord. There for me is room, Lord. We're going to share that tonight. The worship team is going to help us sing a very familiar old chorus. Pour on worthy me, yes, even me. Even me. Where are you in your walk with the Lord tonight? Where do you stand? Have you recognized your sin? Have you recognized the fact that if you are not living under the blood of Jesus Christ, then you are living under the judgment, the same judgment that slain Belshazzar? Are you living under the grace of God? I praise God for his grace tonight. Because it's only by the grace of God that I am where I am. And it's only by the grace of God that he keeps me faithful every day. Where are you in your walk with God? Wherever you are, we need to come together at the foot of the cross. And we need to uplift each other. We need to come and we need to bring ourselves. We need to confess our sins. We need to cry out to him to come and to forgive us and to move in our lives. We need to bring our family members. We need to bring our friends. We need to bring life circumstances and we just need to, to lay it at the foot of the cross because there's room there for us. All unworthy though we are, he is able to take what we offer and to work it all together for our good, for those of us who love him and who walk with him daily. Pardon every sin, Lord. And place thy power within, Lord. And I from this hour will follow thee. Are you there tonight? Are you there? And if you are there, you have family, you have friends that you need to bring before him this evening as we pray and sing together. To thy cross I come. To thy cross I come.
that flows from deep within. There is a river. And you know, when we come to the river of God, when we come to the grace that flows, then we can be assured that God is going to meet us there. We sang it earlier, to the river I am going. Lord, I need to meet you there. God is calling us to come. He's waiting for us to come with open arms. Because you see, God wants to answer prayer. And God wants to move in your life. God wants you to know that he can come and he can come in deep. And he can change you. He can change your life. He can give you a brand new heart. A brand new spirit. There is a river that flows from deep within. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Where are you tonight in that? Is there some sin that's within your life that's been holding you and keeping you back? And you know, maybe maybe it's the sin of being content where you are. Maybe it's the sin of complacency. Because you come to service after service after service and you hear God's word preached and preached time and time and time and time again. And because you are so comfortable where you are, it doesn't actually pierce your soul or your heart. Well, our prayer tonight is that the word of God and the very spirit of the living God might pierce your heart. And that you would know that he is speaking to you and he is calling you. And that you would know that things are not right with where you stand at this moment. But if you would just come and confess, if you would come to the river of God's grace, if you would come and be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, just allow God to forgive you your sins in the name of Jesus, then you can be set free. And the life that you've been wanting to live and desiring to live for years now can be yours if you would let the Lord have his way. There is a river. That never shall run dry. But the secret is that you call out and you come before God calls you to give an account for the way that you have been living. And the invitation is given again and again and again and again this evening to come and to make matters right with God as we share.
are you walking daily? You know, we get caught up sometimes because we know the words and we just rhyme them off the top of our heads and we really don't stop to think. We don't really stop to listen to what we are, what we are saying, what we are asking. I want you to ask yourselves these questions tonight. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Yes or no? These are yes or no questions. No explanations needed. I don't need justification. I don't need explanation. I need a yes or no answer. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Because if the answer is no, then that's where you need to be. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yes or no? Because if the answer is no, then that's where you need to be. Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Or do you go to sleep at night wondering if you're going to wake in the morning? Or when you do wake, are you going to be in the presence of the Savior, having to give an account of your life? Do you rest peacefully? Do you rest filled with the comfort and the knowledge that you are safe in the arms of Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Lay aside. The last verse tells you what to do. It says, lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed. It is that simple. It is that simple. If you're saved here this evening, if you know the Lord as your God, your Savior, your Deliverer, if it was easy to say, yes, Lord, will you stand? Will you stand? Because when you come to him, was it difficult to get him to forgive you? Did you have to beg for his forgiveness? Did you have to work for your forgiveness by him? Oh, no. It is easy to come because he's waiting. And he's the one that's calling. And so the challenge is for you to come and just lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because you see, there's still a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. It hasn't stopped. There is still power in the blood of Jesus Christ. And until the day comes when we stand in his presence, we still have the opportunity and the gift of grace around us today. Be washed. Our prayer is that you would be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul of me. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb.
these are a couple of good old ones, right? Yeah, good to dig them out. Great truths in those words. Glad there's cleansing in the Savior's blood for you. There's cleansing for the world. There's cleansing. And oh, that those of you who don't know Christ would come on board, as the old chorus just said, and ship for glory. Be in haste. Make up your mind. We're going to sing together a closing song. The band seems to be ready and eager to go. Ah, you wouldn't leave, would you? I know. You're learning me well. They're saying, I'm not moving an inch until he says I can. All right. Well, we're going to sing victory in Jesus. Amen. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory, gave his life. On Calvary to save a wretch like me. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. That's one of my favorite songs. Probably number one for me. I love this old song. I heard about a mansion. He's built for me in glory. Band, are you ready? All right. We're going to sing the three verses through. I'm going to invite the Sergeant Major, if you would come and uh, conclude in prayer this evening, please.
thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We want to thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary that we can come before you with our sin and the wash clean. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this night. We thank you for your servant who stood beyond the word of God. We thank you, Lord, because we live in this dispensation of grace, a, a time when we could come to you, kneel at the foot of the old rugged cross, and, Lord, lay our sin before you, and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, the Lord, just now as we leave this place in a few moments, we go to our different homes. We pray, Lord, that you'll go with us. We know you will. We know, Lord, that you'll guide us. We know that you will. We know, Lord, that you'll strengthen us. We know that you will. But, Lord, help us to recognize your presence with us each and every day. Lord, move by your spirit, Lord, in this place along this shore. And, oh, God, we pray that in the days that are ahead we'll hear of many men and women, young people coming to acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. We pray this because we know it's possible. Amen. We pray this because we know it's going to happen, not because of anything that we would do, but because of Jesus and his love for us. So, Lord, we pray that you'll continue to minister your grace to your people and help us, Lord, be servants of yours as we dispense that grace to others whom we will meet every, each and every day. Lord, we love you, we adore you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior and our coming King. We pray it. Amen.